What is up, guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. If you are new here, you should know that we like to play around with cutting-edge equipment whenever we can. We just got our hands on a powerhead by Abyss, the Abyss Flow Cannon 150, or AFC 150 for short. Before I get into some of the details of this pump, I want to be completely transparent about the fact that Abyss kindly provided us with a unit as a token of support for this channel. We are not being paid to do a review on the pump, and Abyss did not have any input on the content of this video. Further, we did purchase a second unit for ourselves, whatever that's worth. I wanted to throw the disclaimer out there, but real talk, I've mentioned many times on this channel how much I like Abyss, and this pump is only going to make sense for ones of you out there. If you're in the market for a pump like this, you likely know who you are, and I don't know how much my words are going to have any impact on that. Having said that, let's say you are in the market for a pump like this. There's not a ton of hands-on information out there for it. So I'd like to bridge that gap for folks that are aspiring to do something big and crazy, like getting an AFC 150. This pump is overkill for my application, but I am always interested in trying out higher end gear like this. So you might be wondering, what professional curiosity am I looking to satiate with this pump? Obviously flow, right? Flow is one of the most important aspects of keeping a healthy reef aquarium. It carries food to and waste away from corals. The tricky thing is, today's success with corals leads to tomorrow's failures as the new growth of coral restricts flow in the reef tank. That flow restriction can be very bad for large colonies and things can go downhill very quickly. It is common for a colony that's been growing great to either block flow to other corals in its vicinity or in some cases become so large that it restricts flow to other parts of itself, and that can lead to quick, massive die-offs. Your tank's flow design has to constantly be reevaluated, especially when things are going well. If there are devices out there that can provide flow better, or is more reliable, I am interested. Which brings us back to extreme pumps like this abyss. It's always a question. At what point does a super high-end pump or powerhead make sense? After all, there are plenty of very nice offerings from other companies at a fraction of the price. One of the little known things about commercial coral farming is that there's actually very little benefit to being an early adopter of new technology or new methodologies in general. A lot of the time, the experimental new stuff just doesn't work as well or reliably as the old ways that have worked for decades. The new tech might be really impressive and the performance through the roof and has a lot of bells and whistles, but the long-term reliability of the device to me is way more important. And the new stuff, frankly, has no track record in that regard. I need a Honda Accord, not a Ferrari. I don't want a super high-performance device that's always going to be in the shop. Business-wise, it makes a lot more sense just to let somebody else try this stuff out for years before trying it for yourself, especially when there's a lot on the line. Let's say you have a thousand gallon system. It's full of coral. There is a major disincentive to try new things for fear of messing up a good thing that's already working. Having said that, there's a lot of stuff I do around here that makes little to no business sense, and I am all about trying new stuff, especially when it's super high quality. In this case, I'm not really looking for some crazy AI-driven feature set or anything like that. What I'm looking for with this pump is ultimate reliability. Reliability is especially important in a commercial farm setting where you just need things to be rock solid. I don't want dramatic devices that need attention all the time. I want stuff to work and not set itself on fire. And I'm looking at you, every aquarium heater ever. Pumps tend to be a major failure point in many reef systems, whether it's a return pump that just dies one day, or an in-tank magnet holding a power head in place that cracks and starts to rust. Pump failures can lead to both electrical hazards as well as heavy metal contamination. Multiply that risk over hundreds of devices in a coral farm, you can start to see why an industrial grade reliable pump is sounding more and more attractive. It took me a very long time to put this video together, in large part because I wanted to use the AFC 150 for a significant period of time. In this case, we installed it on December 8th, 
So it's been in operation here for roughly four months. In that time, we've done literally nothing to it maintenance-wise, and it's been purring right along. Let's go over some details on this pump. Right off the bat, I have to say that this pump is, again, overkill for any tank here at Tidal Gardens. It's made for public aquariums or perhaps pond-sized aquaculture applications, and it shines when you need to move water from one end of the tank 20 feet plus to the other end. Our longest tanks here are 10 feet, which is a big tank, no doubt, but the flow capacity of the AFC 150 is intended for a much larger aquarium. It can produce roughly 14,000 gallons per hour of flow with a burst mode of nearly 16,000 gallons per hour. With this very beefy controller, you can run it continuous or in different programmed flow patterns. It has two built-in functions, wave and random. I think it's possible to control it to do fancier stuff with another controller like a GHL or Hydros, maybe Neptune 2. This part I have not messed with. I'm just using it straight out of the box. The one that we settled on is the wave function where you set a desired low flow strength and high flow strength and how much time to spend at each flow strength level. In our 10 foot long tank, we could not really go much above 70% power without it splashing pretty aggressively on the other end. Also, a word of caution, with any kind of pump like this that's controllable, you can create a harmonic wave where you essentially make this wave that builds in power and it can send water cascading over the walls of the tank. Besides making a mess, you are applying a ton of force on your tank and that can very easily blow out a seam. So be very careful to not do that. The other issue with cranking up this pump too high is that it can suck an air vortex in and send bubbles through your tank. We kind of had to play around with the minimum height needed from the water surface to avoid this. Believe it or not, this is the itty bitty baby of the Abyss Flow Cannon lineup. There is an AFC 400 model and then a monstrous AFC 1200 model that I imagine is only really appropriate for like the largest of aquarium exhibits. As for power consumption, the AFC 150 runs between 4 watts at the lowest flow setting to 150 watts at max power. Just as an aside, it has an immersion rating of 8 feet, which is not going to be meaningful to most hobbyists. To put that into perspective, 8 feet is roughly the depth of Andrew Sandler's tank right at the bottom, so this is like more for like public aquarium specs. Speaking of public aquarium specs, you may be kind of horrified to hear that upon purchasing this pump, you might struggle a bit to install it onto your tank. There is no mounting system included, no magnet, nothing. The target market for a product like this is pretty much a bespoke application, and the installation of this pump is going to be an engineering consideration going in. There are three main methods to install this pump. First, there is a magnet option, and that magnet option for my thickness of glass was an eye-watering $500. For regular home aquariums, I imagine this will be a popular choice, but as you can imagine, this is not your everyday powerhead magnet. It's the kind of magnet that's expecting to hold in place what amounts to a boat motor through one inch thick glass or thicker. It is scary strong, like rip a pacemaker out of your chest strong. I think if you get your fingers stuck in a magnet like this, you just can't have it back. The second method is to purchase a pipe clamp and clamp it to a titanium pipe to submerge it from above. This install I have seen a few different times, and I expect that it's going to be the most popular method if you take in all the different mounting methods. You don't see a lot of ceiling mounted stuff at the hobbyist level, but it is kind of an elegant thing in big installs. It especially makes sense for tanks that have glass that's so thick that the magnet can't hold. And on giant aquariums, that is a thing. The third installation method is an in-tank installation using real or artificial rock. I think Abyss is making a fake rock that you can install the pump into, kind of like what Tunzi did way back in the day with their smaller, like, Turbell pumps. But I think that in a pinch, you could probably strap it to your aquascape if your rock were can handle it. For my application, I chose the magnet, obviously. In order to attach the magnet, it has to be screwed to the back of the pump. 
The pump has this titanium housing that can be removed, but there's little to no wiggle room. The manufacturing tolerances on the AFC-150 are super, super tight. I don't know of a good technique to remove it. I do, however, know of a pretty bad technique, which you kind of take like a plastic card, you wedge it into the gap and lightly tap it with a rubber mallet. I don't recommend doing it this way, but it did work for us. You may have to remove this outer titanium shell for maintenance, but for the purposes of this magnet install, you actually don't have to remove it. If you have a long enough T-handle Allen wrench, you can go in through the front of the pump and screw it in carefully. Helpful tip, when you're doing this, make absolutely sure that the other half of the magnet is far away. It sounds like an obvious common sense thing, but if it happens to be sitting off to the side close by, and you fiddle with the screws too close to it, you might have a really bad day if it snaps together. I do have a kind of a funny story about this magnet. We accidentally broke it once. While trying to catch a fish in this big show tank, one of our guys either bumped the power head on the inside or tried to move it from inside the tank. Anyway, the leverage on the pump was enough to lose contact with the outside magnet and it went crashing to the floor. I say crashing because it literally broke into pieces. Most smaller magnets at one time or another have fallen down and it's not a big deal, but this sucker's huge and it can break. This is probably a good time to bring up the warranty on these devices. There is a 10 year warranty if you register within the first month, so make sure you do that. Having said that, it is not going to cover gross negligence like I just described. For fun, I asked, and they gave a very polite, hell no, that's not covered. Luckily, we were able to super glue the magnet back together and slap it right back onto the tank, no harm, no foul. A lesson learned, if you want to remove this thing, make sure to secure the magnet on the outside of the tank. Moving on, as for the controller, it is extra beefy as well. It's an IPU enclosure giving it a degree of water resistance and houses both the controller as well as the power supply. I like that because it makes wire management a lot more streamlined. The housing is like this giant heatsink, which is also nice because the power supplies can get toasty hot. The way that we like to mount all of our pump controllers is to make a mounting plate out of type 1 PVC and attach it to our aluminum stands. We make sure to use just enough material needed to hold the controller and give it plenty of open space for those heat sinks to do their work. In order to attach it to the aluminum stand, we have these roll-in nuts that accept an M8 bolt and we just screw them in from the back. This particular Abyss pump we wanted to try out on our Peninsula tank. We currently have a couple of CJ Voyager 10s on there, but I would like a more randomized flow going on, and the Voyager 10s are not controllable in that way. The only flow that we have on this tank currently is the return pump from the sump, which is an Abyss A400 that's delivering flow to six aquariums, and two Abyss A200s run in a closed loop. So I guess once this AFC 150 is installed, it will be an all abyss tank, which will be a first for us. Kind of a novelty. Every other tank, there's at least one other brand, mostly Ecotech, but we've got some Ciche like we mentioned earlier. We have some Maxpect Gyres, and we have some AI Neros in the smaller tanks. Anyhow, let's see how this goes. I have to say, I like it. The flow that it generates is wonderful. It's practically silent and Abyss pumps in general have proven to be very reliable in our experience. The form factor is going to turn a lot of people off, but realistically, a pump like this is going to be used in a much larger aquarium where it will make little to no visual impact. In quote unquote small tanks like my 600 gallon SPS reef, it's going to appear distractingly large. It's not quite so bad on this similar sized peninsula style tank, but on a regular three-sided tank, it's gonna stick out. Form factor is going to make less and less of a difference when you start to scale up the size of your aquarium. So Andrew Sandler, when I visited New York this last time, had at least four of these units, but I could only find two of them, and only because they were right there, right near the glass. In a tank under 300 gallons, yeah, that's going to look really bad. But then it begs the question, why would you ever want a pump like this for that application? It can literally send like half the water out of your tank. In conclusion, is the AFC 150 for you? Just playing the numbers here, probably not. 
it's not for everyone. And if you have to ask, the answer is no. Okay, quick story. I have a specialty tractor called a Ventrac. They make these little industrial strength tractors that are very popular with like golf courses and universities for groundskeeping. They have all kinds of different attachments and mower decks, but they have like this really crazy one that's like this triple deck real mower for high-end properties. I happen to have an engineer from Ventrac over at my house and I was asking him all these questions. And I was wondering, you know, if it would ever make sense for me to get that real mower because all of these mowing decks are expensive. May as well get the best one if there is a best one. Kind of like this abyss, he told me that if you have to ask, the answer is no. It is a very niche tool for a very specialized high-end application. And the person buying it understands the pros and cons of such a thing. So that anecdote is what I think of when I think of this powerhead or really any cutting edge piece of equipment. It's not for everyone. Not everybody owns a golf course, but it is still fun to dream. And I'd like to bridge that gap for folks that are aspiring to do something big and crazy. Like I said, I love seeing what's out there. And even though it's total overkill for my tanks, I think it is a very impressive product that is built with no compromises in materials or engineering. All right, thanks again to Abyss our two corporate sponsors, Ecotech Marine and Polyp Lab, and of course you for watching. Until next time, happy reefing, guys.